So welcome uh, to today's lecture. And we will continue with uh, software design. Uh, we will spend some time on the more detailed design decisions. As you can see, we're closing in on code, closing in on the implementation. Uh, so what we'll talk about today is, is, in principle, design decisions in the small. I will not dig too much into the details here. I will just give you some idea of, of the type of decisions you have to make. You, you remember that, that we started from the high level, the architecture level, where we had the big decisions concerned with uh, more or less the entire system, uh, deciding the implementation technologies, uh, making the uh, evaluations of different high level design options for how to deal with persistency, how to sort out security, etc. Uh, you approach that by, 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 by asking yourself a couple of questions. And, and this, is a similar, this is similar throughout the, the, the design activity, that you will look for questions that must find an answer. And, and uh, the questions we will look at today and study today is, is more or less which objects? Because, well, in this, this class we're considering uh, object-oriented implementation. So, so our systems will be implemented in languages that uses objects at runtime, the object abstraction. Objects that send and receive messages, objects that changes their state from time to time, so, what we should design now is a system which is a collaboration of objects. So, what we must decide now, our design decisions at this level, will be which objects are needed, how do we represent these objects, in terms of responsibilities, that is, uh, what type of state may these objects take on, so which attributes are required to model that state, and also what type of behaviors should these object, objects uh, provide to other objects, that is, well, which uh, messages should they recognize, which methods should they implement. So, so these design decisions, well, we're not the first one, ones here. People have done this for, for, for many, many years. So again, there, there are some best practices. In the same way as we had best practices packaged as, as architectural patterns or architectural tactics for, 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 uh, for instance, the, the, the security in the system, well, we have something on this level too, best practices on this level too. And, and there are some, some general ones that are objects, they should be high quality abstractions. What does that mean? Well, we will look more at that in a while. Uh, we should uh, organize them in nice hierarchies, uh, different types of hierarchies, but, but we will look into that too. And then it's important that we, we, we encapsulate so that we provide a nice interface for, for other objects to, to access, to send messages. Encapsulation is nice because it, it, it provides a, a, the interface so no one can, can bypass that, which means that we can do whatever on the inside. And that's a very useful thing when we deal with complex systems because people may consider the interface and don't care about the implementation on the other side, on the inside. So, so these best practices for object collaborations, well, there is more to it. People have, well, looked at what are common collaborations? What type of collaborations can we find in many different systems? 
that uses objects? And can we find best solutions for these common collaborations? Well, then we have more or less like a cookbook. You know, if you buy a cookbook in, in, in the bookstore, uh, the recipes have been tried. Uh, they are tasty. They are not too salty. They are not, well, you see? Something similar here. What are the recipes for these collaborations? Well, in the same way as we had patterns on the architecture level, we talked about design patterns. And today we will just briefly look at three different types of design patterns. So what you see here, a similar structure. We're on a more detailed level, closing in on the implementation, but it's still about design decisions. So which objects, which attributes, which methods for this object and that object? How may these objects or how will these objects interact? That's the design questions that we must answer. OK. So what are we trying to model? And I will try to, to uh, describe a general uh, object-oriented language that has a static view, which is uh, a set of classes or user-defined types. And then we have a dynamic view, which is concerned with the instances of these types, the objects, and how these objects interact. So, so we model two, two views here. We model statically, which is more concerned with what do we have in our toolbox? Which objects may we create in our application? And then we have the dynamic view, which is, OK, now we create objects. And now we describe how these objects, objects exchange messages. So if you go in and, and, and study your, your source code, you will see that, OK, we have objects. We instantiate objects. OK, we have objects sending messages to other objects, invoking methods. OK? That's, that's how our implementations are built up. So, well, you had a class there. It was flashing brief just quickly. But this class, well, what do we do? Well, we create an object. This object represents a type. And the type is defined by its attributes and its methods. OK? So we instantiate this guy here. OK, so now we have the blue guy down there, which is an object. So now we have another uh, type up in, in our uh, class structure here that we instantiate. And now you can see, OK, now we have objects referencing other objects. And these references can be used as addresses sending these messages to other objects. OK? So what we will construct here is a hierarchy, a hierarchy of objects. Not necessarily a tree, even though this will look like a tree. But we can take, well, for that class, we instantiate more objects. And well, now we can send messages along that path, along that link, from that object to the other object. And this is, well, the way we set up our applications. And this is the way our applications work dynamically, sending messages. Instantiate objects that are connected to other objects, send messages back and forth. So when you come home to today after, after class, just bring up your most recent assignment or well, snippet of code that you, you wrote. Just think about it like this, like types and objects links in between objects that are used for message exchange. And you will see that, OK, your code is fairly close. 
it's really close. It's the same. So, on this level, we design a system in terms of types or classes and objects and object interaction. So, this is another view on, on, on the previous uh, uh, structure. Because here, you see, it's, it's not a tree. But we have objects, and this object uh, has some properties, and it has some operations. It's like messages the object understands. But this object over here, it also has some properties and some messages it understands. So if this guy has a reference to that guy, so this object knows the address of this object, the address in the memory, well, it can use that address to send a message. This guy interprets the message. The message contains the name of the method, the parameters, everything that's in the signature of that operation. Well, and that operation is invoked, and possibly there is a result which is then uh, returned back to this object, and the computation execution continues. So, what can happen? Well, if you, if you go back to the code this afternoon or tonight, look at your code. What does your operations do, the implementations of, of the methods? What do you do in there? Well, it's combinations of inspecting the state. Well, you look at the value of a property and updating the state, changing the state. You change the value of one of the properties, attributes, okay? So it's in fact a huge state machine that you're manipulating with your source code here. And the manipulations comes from these messages that are exchanged. Again, don't try to do this exercise without having source code in front of you because then it will be way too philosophical. So print out or just in front of the screen, oh, here's a state transition. He, okay, here I inspect the state. This is a message sent to that object, okay? So you get a better understanding of what's going on because if you know, understand what's going on when your applications execute, well, it will be so much easier to model systems. It will be so much easier to solve problems with programming. OK, so these object models, objects that communicate, objects that exchange messages, well, UML provides us with a couple of diagrams. Uh, the one uh, you see here is a sequence diagram. And you can see the uh, different objects. This is a representation of an actor. Uh, here are different objects up here. And you can see the arrows here representing message exchange. So our object diagrams in UML gives us a notation, gives us a language, a graphical language for expressing which objects do you have in some collaboration. And these objects, which messages do they send to one another? And you may also model structure, control structure, because we all know that inside a method it's not just one sequence. We have selections like if statements, switch statements, so on and so forth. And we have our loops, while loops, repeat until, uh, for loops, so on. Okay? But UML object diagrams, especially the sequence diagram here, uh, provides us with the language 
for graphical modeling. So collaboration. Well, now we're coming back to, to the use case. You remember the use case being a flow of events. What is the flow of events? Flow of events is actually quite easy to map to objects exchanging messages. I should say, well, quite easy. It's not always that easy, but it's, that's the problem solving part here. But what we can agree upon is that in our software, we must provide an implementation of any of these four use cases. And since we're object technology, it's objects that collaborate, OK? But we need a static view for that because we must describe the possible objects that can exist in this application. Because we cannot describe each and every object that will exist in the application. Think of this application where you have users. Should we describe each and every object, each and every possible user beforehand? No, of course not. Instead, we define a type and this type is the abstraction of all users in the system. And then we can show how, well, this user object, a specific user object is created as a flow of events translated into objects exchanging mess messages. And Somewhere in this implementation of the register user uh, use case, well, we will create a user object. And for that, we use the class or, well, the user defined type as a template. So, collaborations describe high level functionality with some details. Not necessarily all the details that you will find in an implementation language, but it's a step towards that. And we can use this to verify our models. Can we, with the classes we have, instantiate objects that we can configure in a way that they communicate and talk to each other in a way that we implement that we achieve the behavior as described in the use case. So we can take a sequence diagram and if we can model the desired behavior in the sequence diagram we can be pretty certain that well we have everything in place but while we model, while we while we create this this uh, sequence diagram, if we well hey we sh probably need an object here to represents th that represents this information or provides us with that behavior. Well, that's part of the verification. What you have to do then in the next iteration is, of course, to add a class for that object so that you can modify your sequence diagram in a way that you get all the behaviors as described in the use case. So, this is the interaction frame. And, well, it's a frame. So it's like, it's a, it's a box. And into this box, you will throw your objects and you will throw your messages. And this is an encapsulation of an interaction. You can actually say that this is a, an example of abstraction. You have this being the module the box into which you, you throw your objects and, and how they exchange messages. 
So the sequence diagrams. At the top of your sequence diagrams, you will find objects. And then these objects will exchange messages. And time is a dimension here. So, so time passes as we go down in this sequence diagram. You can uh, depict different types of communication creation and deletion of uh, objects, there are uh, control structures, support, all this. So the building blocks, uh, very simple, at the top an object here, and then just as you remember we, we were talking about an object created, an object disposed, well, you can use something called a lifeline to model that. So as long as we have this uh, dashed line there, the object exists, OK? However, an object is not always active. Active, what is, how do you define an active object? Well, an object currently involved in some message exchange. Either has received a message or has sent out a message. All these objects that are involved in that are active objects. And you can model that using this, uh, this bar here. So, so you make it a little bit thicker to show that, OK, this, this object is active now. Then you have different types of messages. And the normal uh, type of message used in, 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 in uh, languages are synchronous communication, where a message is sent. And the, other, the object that's sent, the sender object, waits until the other object returns. Well, that's synchronous. Asynchronous is, is something else, and, and uh, it means that the sending object can actually continue to execute something else. OK, so we can now, with the building blocks, build up something like this. Objects at the top. and objects exchanging messages. So here we have some, some synchronous message calls. Here we have a return. So we know that this message will return something to this object. Then we have the, an interaction frame here, which is a loop. This is just to show you what it may look like, OK? As I said, well, advanced sequence diagrams, it's, it's maybe not the, the best term here. It's slightly more advanced because we have these interaction frames that, that we can use to, to capture, well, other things than, 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 than just sequential messaging. Because you remember what I said was that time passes as we go down. However, there is a way to change that slightly, and, and that is to, to invoke these, uh, or to include these interaction frames. Because now we will have support for uh, uh, guarded, uh, guarded uh, uh, interactions with opt. Alternatives, similar to an if statement uh, with alt, and then loop, just to represent different type of loop constructs, OK? So what we can do then is that, well, you saw that we just added a loop, uh, uh, loop interaction frame. But, but we can get something like this. I just 
give you 10 seconds to, to... How many of you would say that you have a fairly good idea of what the code for this would look like? Objects at the top, messages being sent, Can you see that this is at least, well, not too far from the code you normally write? So what we have here is that from the start we have some object of this type. So we don't really have a name for it. It's just like some object of this type. And this uh, object sends, oops, not that. Uh, it uh, invokes a constructor. So this is constructor method, okay? That creates an instance of the application type, class, with the name A. Okay? Then we have some, some uh, other object over here just representing some administrator, also not named. So we don't really have a, a reference, uh, just some. So then we have a loop. And this is loop as long as something is not complete, most likely the application. So a while loop would be a good option here. Or some loop construct where you check the condition and you loop until the condition is not satisfied, okay? So, uh, some pupil here sends in an application. The administrator will check the application by sending a message to itself. You know, objects, sometimes in your, in your objects you have methods that you invoke in other methods in that object. That's a self invocation, self message. So the administrator here checks. Part of checking is to retrieve some information. You remember inspecting the state, inspecting the state of that object, the application object. And now we can go on here and we can uh, say that if the administrator deems the application not being complete, they will ask the pupil to modify it. And the pupil will modify it. And then, since it's not complete, remember, we go up here and we loop again. So it's sent in again, it's checked. So now, you see we have this iterative behavior until the administrator deems the application to be complete, and then we go down here. And if the administrator says, okay, it is complete, well, then we can admit the pupil, and we create a notification with the name B. So here we create an object, and this object is returned back to the pupil object. I just explained to you some source code. So that was the object models, the how you can uh, how you can describe how objects interact. Because we want to describe how our objects interact when we uh, create the collaborations for our use cases. So, properties of good object models. Well, we think of abstraction, we think of modularity, we think of hierarchy, we think of encapsulation. Because abstractions will reduce information. We have to divide models up, we have to divide it up into smaller pieces, smaller subsystems. We need to organize the subsystems in different ways. 
and we need to encapsulate them so that we provide an interface that others can focus on. Instead of having to understand how it works internally, they can just use an interface. So you've seen this, this slide before, but it's, it's very important to remember. It's a simplified description. You focus on some details, suppressing others, and that's context dependent. What type of behavior, what type of state will you, do you require from this object for this application in this context? And as you see, in an object-oriented system, objects are abstractions, they are simplifications. Classes, of course, since they represent many objects, they are also simplifications, abstractions. So a class is an abstraction for many objects. Interfaces are abstractions of behavior. Now we're talking about the language construct uh, interface here. And an operation is also an interface, uh, is also an abstraction. A simplification of the behavior. Just the behavior you want, just the behavior you need, nothing else. Modularity. We de decompose into classes, we decompose into more physical uh, uh, modules like files. Just to, to, to structure our design, just to structure our implementation. Imagine a system with uh, couple of thousand classes, uh, everything in one file. Will be a nightmare. That's why you have your packages, that's why you, you make use of the, the uh, folder hierarchy on your hard drive. To organize, to make it easier to access, easier to understand, etc. Hierarchy. Well, Typically, you uh, decompose into subsystems to understand, and then you put them back together. You compose them, and you compose them into larger systems. So, so what you saw on, on some of the first slides, where you had like objects that we instantiated, and we had the references between the objects, that's a composition. Instantiate an object, instantiate another one, make a reference between them. Two objects put together, composed into a larger system. For uh, your classes, to some extent, the, the, uh, also the objects in, in, in other languages that where you, if you have just objects, you can talk about something called inheritance, uh, where you can have one abstraction that inherits properties or inherits behavior from another abstraction. This means that you can specialize, so you can have a class person with all the attributes and behaviors that you need to describe a model person objects. And then you can specialize that into students and teachers. So you can inherit from this person. So students can inherit and add what's ever unique for a student and we can have a teacher class inheriting also from person specializing with whatever properties and behaviors that are unique for a teacher. You can do something similar uh, uh, prototype chains where you have more or less uh, well, if you don't have a static thing like the class, you can, you can um, well, you can still do something similar in, in other object-based languages. So encapsulation is not just about hiding information, but it's actually, I think, in my opinion, the most powerful mechanism that most people, sadly, are neglecting. Because uh, just imagine uh, you guys operating your computer without a decent interface. I'm not talking about necessarily the graphical user interface, but, but okay, that's also part of it. But 
just pushing the start button. Remove that interface. What do you have to do? Well, you yourself have to access, well, well put two pins together to connect to start the machine. That's the analogy to not encapsulating functionality properly. What can happen if you don't have the power button on your computers? Well, you will increase the risk that someone makes a mistake, ruin, well, destroying the computer, shortcutting it, whatever. Now we have this interface, so everybody presses the power button. Okay. No shortcutting. Reduce the risk of failed computers. It's the same for software. A good interface that everybody uses is a minim minimize the risk that someone is ma misusing an object. Okay, so we had the objects, and now we're going to talk about class diagrams. And even though you use a different word for, for classes or well, call them user-defined types or whatever. This is about modeling and it doesn't have to be necessarily a direct mapping to your implementation language. For, for most object-oriented languages there is a mapping and you're lucky. If there isn't you can still find these diagrams useful. But a class diagram, as I mentioned a couple of times now, it, it models the static structure. It's more or less models, is classes, and these classes are descriptions of objects that we may instantiate, objects that we may create objects of. Okay? And there are important things that we can express on this level. And, and one of the most important things is, is this, the hierarchy. How do we order, how do we rank, how do we compose our objects? What are the part-whole relationships? You know, when, when we will take objects, instances of these classes, and put them together. Uh, inheritance, if we have that. Which classes inherit from other classes? Well, this is difficult to express on the object level. And as you will see, on this level, the class level, it will be, it's a very powerful modeling uh, it's a, well, a very par powerful model here for, for expressing extremely complex object structures. So, human class diagrams can be used for anything from conceptual modeling. So, so you're modeling what type of information will we have in our system? Concepts, abstract. But you can also use it, as I mentioned a couple of times now, your classes that you will have in your implementation, the user-defined types that you will have in your, in your implementation. So I claim that class diagrams represent the main objects and the main object interactions. Because remember, a prerequisite for interactions in between objects was that we had some kind of address to send a message, some reference where we could send a message. And on the class, in the class diagram, we can model the fact that there will be a reference between one object and another object. So if you look up here, uh, this is a conceptual model, so it's, uh, uh, but we can say that uh, a device has a feature. 
we can say that device objects will have references to feature objects just by a simple association arrow up here. Uh, so this is the class icon in UML. The three compartments, the name compartment, uh, attribute compartment, and operation compartment. So, so there are different ways of, of, since UML is a generic modeling notation, it provides support for most things, which means that I often get a question, do I have to use everything? And the an answer is, of course, no, but as long as you can express what you want to express. But you can, you can uh, model a, uh, uh, a public attribute, that's a plus here, or a private attribute. Here we have a type for that attribute. Same here for the different uh, uh, methods. So, so what we have here is, uh, in fact, well, the responsibilities uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for objects of this class. Okay, so now we're coming back to object-oriented design or object-oriented problem solving. Describe the objects, we talked about that. Describe how objects work together, talked about that. But now, we have to fill up the toolbox. We must describe what objects we have and how these objects fit together, how they connect. And we do that by creating these classes or user-defined types that are abstractions of objects. And we have to think about, OK, what should be the state for objects of this class? Which attributes, which, well, what, which data, which information must be stored in these objects? This is a design decision on that level. Which services, that is the behavior, that's another design decision. Okay, so I know it's an hour to lunch, but just want to give you a, a very uh, nice little example of, uh, well, a small problem here. We're hungry. And our solution to this problem is to make a pizza. That's our use case. And first question, which recipe? Well, which design? Okay? Before we can implement, we need a recipe. We need a design. So I have some requirements here. Uh, there must be garlic in there. Uh, complexity. I'm hungry, so not more than two hours. Maybe I exaggerate a bit here, but, but not more than two hours. Uh, cost less than uh, 15 uh, RMBs, Chinese money. Uh, where can I find such a recipe? Well, I, some smart student, I'm not saying that you are not, but said that, okay, but don't forget that there are off-the-shelf solutions. So you just go to the store, buy a uh, pizza, put it into the micro, problem solved. Yes, that's true. But we can go to a cookbook, and we can try to figure out if there are some reference solutions to this, a recipe. Or we can, uh, well, be a little bit more uh, dangerous, come up with our own recipe. OK. So after the break, uh, we will continue with this little example. And I will try to explain to you, well, what it corresponds to on objects and class level. Okay? So I see you guys in 10 minutes. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, we're talking about this, this uh, pizza example. Uh, so uh, 
we sorted out the recipe now or well, trying to come up with our own recipe. Doesn't really matter if we go to a, a cookbook or look up something on the, the, the internet or if we, well, just try it on and see what we end up with. Uh, we have to start somewhere and that is, in our case, well, what type of objects are needed? And, and when you make a pizza, the objects will be, uh, well, the ingredients and, and your, well, utensils, your, your, the equipment. And uh, so, so uh, this one is a US example, so that's why you have pizza doubles that are defrosted. <laughs> but, but okay, uh, there are different recipes. Maybe you make your own dough. Well, that will require some more object interactions beforehand, but now we go for the uh, low hanging fruit, so, so we just defrost something, uh, take something out from the fridge. Then we need some, some uh, tomatoes, uh, we need some, some uh, uh, well, garlic is here, that was important, some, some cheese, and then we come to the, to the equipment. We need an oven. Without an oven, it's, uh, yeah, doable but difficult. Uh, we need some knife for, well, chopping and so on, cupboard, and we need a rolling pin. We're not, like, experts, so, so we need a rolling pin. Okay. So, so this is our, well, the objects. But what you will see here is, okay, we have some, some uh, we have four pizza doll bowls. We have uh, four of, of some tablespoons. There are like many, it's not just one object for each here. There are some objects that we can classify. We can have, well, uh, a number of, of different objects here and we can describe them, not each and every one of them, but we can describe them in a class as a user-defined type. And this is the first step to do the classification. And if you look at the, the, the classification of, uh, from the previous slide, well, what you can see here is, well, we have a couple of classes, user-defined types. So what this says is really just one thing. In our solution, that is in the process, the process of making a pizza, that's our solution, we will have cutboard objects, we will have knife objects, we will have salt objects, we will have tomato objects, and we will ha have dough bowl objects. That's the only thing we can read out from this. So what we have to do now is, is remember, these are the first design decisions we're making. Uh, but since we're talking about classes, what, what would be the next design decisions here? What would be the next design decisions here? Sorry? Construction. Yeah, not construction. We have to think before we act. That's the whole purpose of the design here. But what we need to start doing is, is to, 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 to think about, well, the attributes and the state. So, so, we actually have to come from this model of a tomato to this model here. And uh, if we focus on, on the state first, well, for the tomato, we have to think of color, weight, ripeness. If you look at the ingredients, the recipe, these are, this is data that you can extract from there. We also have this uh, uh, chopped, sliced, quartered, whole discussion. I think the, the recipe says only chopped. But at least we need something that takes care of the state for the a tomato object, if it's chopped or if it's whole. Because uh, chopping 
whole tomatoes is one thing, chopping chopped tomatoes is something that we should not allow. But uh, this translates into to, to what you see here, color, weight, ripeness, tomato states. These are, well, responsibilities in terms of, well, the attributes. For to all tomato objects will have a color, a weight, some state of ripeness, and some state of, well, if it's chopped, whole, sliced, or quartered. So any object, any tomato object, can take on, well, that combination of state. But there's more to it. Now we focus on, on the behavior. And if you look at the, the, the tomato here, what we can see is, okay, we have lots of state. So the main behavior here will focus on, well, changing the tomato's state setting the tomato's ripeness, tomato's weight, change color, chopping, well, quartering. So, so based on the attributes that you saw representing the state of the object, you will have a, a well, you can easily find a type of behavior, or more easily find a type of behavior uh, that object requires. And it's important now to remember that we should try to, to, to come up with good abstractions, encapsulate the objects with an interface, have a, create hierarchies. What you see here is the con connection between a tomato and tomato state, for instance. So now we have the objects described as classes. But what's missing? What's missing here? Well, there's no collaboration. We just have the objects. And if we have no collaboration, there is no, nothing that happens. And what is a collaboration? Well, you can see it up here, up here. One object receiving the put message with this parameter, this object reference as a parameter, okay? And then we have another object, the knife, that receives this chop message and it chops whatever is on the cutboard. Gets all the items on the cutboard and chops them. So be aware, no fingers on the cutboard, okay? So in the real world, if we don't have any interaction, nothing will happen. We will not be here, or at least we will not, well, uh, feel anything if all interaction stops. So in the pizza example, we must instantiate objects from the classes that describes our ingredients and equipment and describe how they interact in the same way as we have up here, the code example here in the upper right hand corner. So in this example we have the objects and we have the the code down here. So, so what we must do now is to, to make sure that the desired behavior is supported by the objects. And the objects are described in the classes. So for the knife, and this is, this is uh, Java code, but I hope you guys can, can parse it. Uh, we have some, some attributes here, just depicting, well, the length of the knife, some uh, reference to an object of the manufacturer uh, class, sorry for that, uh, just call it make, okay. And then we have the behavior. And we can see that there is a method 
called CHOP that takes a reference to a collection of choppable objects that it calls some objects. And this is, this is, well, the implementation level in Java where you have an interface for that collection. But this is what we want to describe in our design. So we don't want to rush all the way down to the, to the code immediately. We want to model this on beforehand. So we want to model how objects receive and send messages, uh, return results. And we want to model the fact that senders must find a path to the receiving objects. And the receiving object must understand a message. And this is what we do on the class level. But first, just check again on the implementation for the cutboard. Well, remember now that we had the knife that was able to chop a collection of iCuttable objects, OK? So it's a prerequisite for this object-oriented design that on our cut boards, we have a collection of cuttable objects. And this is what this method will return. This is like pseudocode, blah, blah, blah. It's not, it's not uh, well, it would be just too much. So, but you, I, I hope you get the idea. So, so when we have the get items message sent to a, a cutboard object, it will return a collection of references to objects, and these objects will implement the iCuttable interface. Maybe now you can start to see why it's good to have like a step before we code where you try to model these relationships. But uh, this was the code where we put the tomato. You can see we put an iCuttable object. And we now know that we can infer that, OK, the tomato, our tomato class, must implement this interface, iCuttable. Otherwise, we can never place a tomato on the cutboard. And then we let the knife have a go at everything on the cutboard by this. Okay. So here we create a connection between the cutboard and the tomato object. Here, we have a connection between the knife and the cutboard. And with the get items here, we actually get a reference from the knife to the tomato so that the knife can send a chop message to the tomato. Again, not easy to understand just from a presentation. Go back, print out, or have a look at your screen. Try to sit and, and think about what's going on. It will help you a lot in your future careers if you get a grip on, on objects interacting and, and how you must organize your, your own types, how they are, should connect, how they should inherit, and so on and so forth. It will help you a lot. So now we have, well, the dynamic structure. We have our classes. The classes have behavior implemented. So now we can put the, the main method together. This, well, where it all starts. You remember the first object that we instantiated on the second slide or whatever it was. 
And in that, okay, we create an oven, oven object. And we start that and, well, we put a, some, some uh, uh, degrees here for the oven. So we preheat that one. Then we can start chopping. So we can implement the recipes, the recipe here. But, okay, now we talked about static structure, dynamic structure. And one of the things that we've seen here is that objects must be linked have a reference to other objects in order to send messages. There must be this path from one object to another if you would like to send a message to that object. So, how can we express this on the class level? Well, in the UML diagram, there is something, the UML class diagram, I should say, there is something called associations. You can associate objects of one class with objects of another class. And now we're getting into the more powerful uh, techniques for modeling. So, on the class level, we have two classes, A and B. And this connects A to B. So this is the association. So what does this association translate to? Well, we know that classes user-defined types are not something that it exists uh, at runtime. We just have objects at runtime. So we know that we can instantiate objects of A and we can instantiate objects of B. But what would this association then, what, is, what does it mean? It means that we have reference between this object, which is an instance of A, and this instance of the class B. So we can model on a class level on the, that this type A is associated with type B, which means that objects of type A will have reference, A reference or many references to one or many objects of type B, and vice versa. So this is an alternative way to specify an attribute. You remember the example when we had uh, the tomato state? We put that into a separate module, a separate enumeration, just to make it clearer that, OK, well, we factored that out. and, and we. This is actually what we're doing here. We're, well, we have objects referring to other objects, but these objects are like the manufacturer object for the knife. Not trying to represent everything about the manufacturer inside the knife object, because that will not be a good abstraction. Instead, we create one abstraction for the manufacturer, name, whatever, well, web uh, URL to the web page, whatever we want to, to, to keep track of in this application for the manufacturer. But then we link the objects, link the instances together. But for that, we need the association. So the rule of thumb is small things as attributes, big thingies as references to instances of other classes. And for that, you use the associations. So now I'm going to show you uh, some examples just to, to, for you to, to see how powerful this uh, association is. So now we have a company, an employee. We have a class representing a company and a class representing employee. So just, well, we can create employee objects. One object representing each employee. So if you look at the semantics, we can instantiate objects of this, and we can instantiate objects of that. And you see that I've added some numbers here. One, and then this is not a number, but it's an, uh, an, uh, the asterisk here, is, or a star, is, is representing any number, like a wild card. 
So what would be the interpretation of this? What can you say about the object level? Well, any company object will have or refer to or maintain a link to any number of employee objects. So a company may have zero employees or it may have a huge number of employees. And this is how we capture that. And if I just make one small change, what has happened now on the object level? You see the difference? Now we have any number at both ends. What does that mean? Well, company objects may have any type of, or any number of employees. And if you're an employee, you're not necessarily connected to just one company. You can just be connected to several company objects if you want to. I would say, I would argue that this is not semantically correct because any number there, the asterisk over at, over at this end here, means that an employee can, be, can refer to zero company objects. And I would say that if you're not associated with any company object, then you're not an employee. So this is in fact a in semantically incorrect model. So there are properties of these associations that, that, that we, can, we can exploit. Uh, there is the name, contract. Just saying that, OK, a company has a number of contracts referring to an employee. Referring to employees, I should say. We have something called role names. We'll talk more about that soon. We have the multiplicity. That's the numbers. That's, that's the size of this association. And then we have something called navigability. That is, in what direction can you navigate from one object to another? There are, as we will see, something called bidirectional and unidirectional. So, association names. I took an example that is... Uh, also semantically incorrect. Can you catch it? Yeah? Because the students can be registered in more than one place. Yeah. So, so this guy here, a student typically can be registered to more than one course. Uh, so, so this should be a, but what you can do here is that um, you can actually read. A course has a number of registrations referring to student objects and you can access that collection using the student, student's role. So this means that, well, you, 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 can, you can read a model. And that's good because that's good for checking. A student object can register to one, oops, course. Not good. We would have spotted that immediately. So uh, the association name here in the middle is important and then the, the names of the attributes at the end they are good and if they're useful use them otherwise not there are no real uh, navigability what you can see here is an example of bidirectional if you are 
inside a student object, so to speak, you will, would like to navigate to the, to the courses that the student has registered to. And if you're in a course object, you would like to be able to, to track all the students that are registered to that course. So you want to go in that direction. Okay, so, so, so this is a, an, a model, and I argue that this model cannot be, well, with that little modification that, that this guy here, if this is a, a, a many-to-many, well, this actually requires that we have links in both directions. And if you have a many-to-many -many relationship, that's not something that you find support for in any programming language, or maybe some, but not, definitely not all. But so you need some, some kind of objects in between. You need some collection objects in here, you see? Representing all the, or collection of links from one object to, another, to, to all the other objects. You see? So this, before you can implement this, you need to, to, to refine this design further. Because, well, the multiplicities here, you can, you can do a lot with these because you can have zero to one, you can have zero to many, or just many. Or you can have exactly one instance, or you can have four to six instances. You can have five. You, the semantics can be very precisely specified for, well, a domain. And it could be that uh, in this system, we do allow that employees have uh, relationships with two, one to two companies. or four to five, but if it says four to five, there must be four or five references from an employee object. object. So, so these are guidelines for the, for the coders, the implementers. Okay. So now we're talking about principles of good design. Well, abstraction, modularity, hierarchy, and encapsulation. What you strive for there is something called high cohesion and low coupling. That is that your modules, your abstractions, should be more, not self-contained, but they should be designed in a way that you minimize external communication. That means that they are cohesive units. And that's good. The other end of this is that you should strive for low coupling, which means that the number of connections from one module to another to any or other modules should be as low as possible because each of these connections is in fact a dependency and dependencies are bad they are difficult because sometimes they are implicit and an implicit dependency is typically something that makes your system fail. If you change something, you should avoid this rigidity. And you get that if you have something that is difficult to change because you get ripple effects. And if you have dependencies between your modules that have dependencies, that have dependencies, well, you have these ripple effects. And remember, abstraction, modularity, encapsulation, hierarchy. If you are good at that, you will get lo high cohesion, low coupling, and you will not end up with the ripple effects. You will not have implicit dependencies. You will make them explicit. The, 
these design principles uh, is something that you learn. And as, well, in any trade, it doesn't matter if you, if, you have a, if you have a carpenter to your house doing something there, uh, well, there are good ones and not so good ones. And it's the same with, with uh, designers, it's the same with implementers, it's the same with the university teachers. Some are good and some are not. But what we can do with software design is that we can try to learn from, well, best practices. And these design principles that you see here, they are supported by a number of design patterns that if you follow these patterns, they will be like the recipe for solution, to solutions for, with high cohesion and low coupling that will make you avoid these, these things you should avoid with your designs. So we've seen for the architecture level, we had some patterns there. There is something called analysis patterns that you can use to analyze requirements. There are design patterns, and we will look at uh, one example for creational patterns, one for structural, and one for behavioral. But then also on the programming level, we have idioms. So there are best practices for how to do things in JavaScript. And there are best practices for how to do things in Java. And there are also something called anti-patterns. OK, you can do it like this in JavaScript, but don't do it. It's a very bad idea. And the same for Java. Don't do it. This is much better. So any type of knowledge, any type of expertise, experience can be packaged as a pattern. So let's look at some, some, some creational patterns, or some, one. Uh, there's no room for, for more than one. What do we have here? Well, creational patterns. Hmm. Remember, the f was it the second slide? third slide maybe, where we create, we create an object structure, okay? We create an object structure by instantiating objects. So this is, this is something that we will do often in our uh, systems, in our implementations. We will create objects. So you can create objects in different ways. You can create or you can r package your object creation in different ways. And then you can pick something that is suitable to a specific situation. So our creational design patterns address just this problem of creating objects. And there are a couple of them. We will just look at one, the singleton. So this is an example of a pattern that will guarantee that at any point of time, there will be just one instance of a particular class a sing that is uh, uh, labeled as, as singleton. So we will never have two objects. And if someone wants to invoke a method, there will be an object, but just one. So, and this is, well, now we will have an opportunity to get a global point of access to this object. And sometimes for performance and simplicity, laziness, that's a good point. For instance, imagine your, your connection to the database in your system, to the persistency uh, part of your system. You would like to, to make sure that you only have one not many. 
one object that you use as a facade to the persistency layer. How can you do this? Uh, now we're talking about the design pattern, but a design pattern must find support for, from the underlying implementation language. And, and this is uh, uh, an example uh, where we have uh, a Java implementation. <coughs> this even has support directly in some programming languages. So you can just tag singleton and, and or annotate the code with singleton and you get it. But, but now it's on the design level so you have to implement it yourself. But what's important here is that we have a protected attribute, a unique instance. Here. And whenever someone would like to get the reference to this unique instance, they send a message to this static method. Static in Java means that it's accessible just using the class name. You don't need an object instance. <coughs> but you can see here that if we don't have, if we haven't created an instance yet, we create an instance, and then we return an instance. If we already have created an instance, we we'll, we'll just return it. But what you can see here is that, that uh, the only way to access the singleton is, is via this, this method here. So you cannot create an object. The only way to create an object is to, well, that shouldn't be a capital I there, but, but it's this method down here, to, to invoke that method. So now we have something that guarantees that at any point of time, someone can just access this singleton that should probably have a different name, <laughs> but, but by invoking this method, this static method here. Structural patterns, they are focusing on, on ways to put objects together in a way that we uh, can achieve, well, something a little bit easier than uh, before. What we will look at now is an example of something called an adapter. And if you have been traveling, you know what an adapter is. Something you plug in to your uh, power outlet, and, well, to adapt to, well, whatever plug you have. So what does that translate to uh, if we talk about software design? Well, if you look at this uh, class diagram, you can see that we have the client. The client is your plug on your cord, okay? And, and this you want to plug into power outlet. However, the plug doesn't fit. So instead, you have an adapter. And this adapter will take care of your request plug and adapt it to the specific request for the power outlet. <coughs> Excuse me. So an example here. We have two abstractions, legacy abstractions, one for the line and one for the rectangle. And what you can see here is that, well, we have uh, different uh, parameters here. For this method draw, here you have the two coordinate pairs. Down here we have one coordinate pair and then one width and one height. Uh, what we would like to do now is to, to create a very simple uh, uh, 
drawing editor. Uh, and, and we would like to store objects, rectangle objects, and, and objects representing lines in some collection. And then from time to time, we need to redraw the screen. So we need to traverse this collection and invoke the draw method for each and every object in there. So what's the problem? Well, and I know this can be done much smarter, but this is just to prove a point. Here's the code. Uh, you see here that, OK, we check which class the object belongs to. And depending upon if it's a legacy line, well, then we invoke the draw method here, there. And there we have a cast, and it, it's really ugly. And I would say one thing, and if you remember the design principles, rigidity, dependent, uh, uh, implicit dependencies, it's full of them. So we have to do something different. <coughs> so now we introduce the adapter. And what is the adapter for this guy? Well, on the left-hand side here, we have the client that will request something. And the request is actually draw. And what you can see here is that here we have now two coordinate pairs. So that's the design decision we made. And then we specialize. So we have two concrete uh, adapters. One adapter class for the line, and one adapter class for the rectangle. And these will make use of the legacy line and the legacy rectangle. And you can see that, OK, here we will have references for that association, OK? So up here, we have an interface. And these guys both implement that in interface, OK? I think I said something before, different before, sorry. This is an interface, and these guys implement that interface. So it's more or less that if this class line says implements this interface, they must provide an implementation for this method up here in the interface. And as you can see, well, they do that. So let's have a look at the code. You can see that both the line and the rectangle now implements the shape interface. And you can see that, well, we do some tweaking down here. We adapt so that this call here, defined by the uh, shape interface, is mapped to the specific request in the legacy line and legacy rectangle. <coughs> so now we can uh, change the redraw everything implementation into something like this. We have now the shape. So we have an array of shape references, references to, to uh, objects that implement the shape interface. We traverse that array. And for each object, we send the draw message. And now we don't have to care, because we have the adapters. We have one draw adapter for the line, and we have one draw adapter for the rectangle. Problem solved. OK? Common problem, one solution, which is known to be a good one, a design pattern. So then we had the third category. There's an entire book. There was a very famous book in the mid-90s, uh, 1990s, you know, way back. Yesterday for me, but way back for you. Uh, uh, written by, well, the gang of four. Uh, four guys got together. There was a huge movement of design patterns. It's actually, it, patterns come from, from from architecture, houses, how to build houses, how to do envir environmental designs, and so on. It's a 
complete uh, area in 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 in, in, uh, in uh, well the more traditional architect world, not the software architect world. But for behavioral patterns, well, it's about communication. How can we best support interactions between objects? Well, depending upon how we structure them and so on and what we want to do, well, we can get something that is better at this or not so good. This is the same things that we talked about when we talked about architectural level patterns. If you have this pattern, well, it's better than this pattern. Same for the design patterns. So we're going to look at the observer pattern. Uh, very common that we have a one object and then many other objects that are interested, a little a curious, what's going on in this object? If something go, happens to this object, I want to know it. It's like your neighbor, you know, a little bit too curious. No, but how do, you, how do you set up a structure that supports that if something happens to an object, many other objects will be notified, informed about that? Well, we have to remember rigidity, implicit dependencies. We don't want to connect this object over here to these objects over here, uh, hardwiring them, so to speak. We want something more flexible. And the observer pattern provides us with that. So what you have here is you have the subject, that's you. And you have the observer, that's your neighbors, OK? And what you want to, what, well, what should happen here is that if something happens to the su uh, subject, if you do something, your neighbors would like to be informed, OK? <clears throat> so what we have here is, is the fact that subjects uh, contain a collection of references to observers. So if something happens here, if the subject changes state, for instance, you wake up, for instance, well, all observers that have attached will now be updated on this state change. He woke up or she woke up now, OK? So with the sequence diagram, it will look something like this. First, the observer attach. And the attachment is, OK, here is my address. Here is my reference. Please, and they add that reference to some collection, OK? And then, when the subject is updated, changes its, its state, well, for all observers, all items in, in this collection, OK, that we have added the observer to, will be notified by this change using this update. So, today's takeaways. Design decisions at all levels. Remember that ask yourself the design questions. Come up with answers. On this level, we're talking about use cases implemented by means of objects and interacting objects. We describe objects using object diagrams, for instance, the sequence diagram. There are others, communication diagrams, robustness diagrams, also variant of object diagrams. And then we have the class diagrams that capture our descriptions of classes of objects and their associations, their inheritance, imp uh, interfaces they, they implement, etc. We can do this in many different ways. However, there is a huge body of experience that we may use. Design principles, things that are known to be good and things that are known not to be so good, and then packaged complete design patterns for recurring problems that we face often. And we just have to adapt 
and adopt these patterns for our particular solution, our particular context. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, next lecture we'll change themes, we will start talk about software testing. So, see you then.